All right. Now we're going to come to you live once again. All right. Uh, I'm not sure what happened, but a, a uh, breaker tripped right here at our top secret broadcasting bunker. And uh, right in the middle of right in the middle of me talking, uh, truly, this is uh, the talk show that hell hates. All right. Um, and I, I don't know exactly. It didn't affect the lights in the room or I'd have been sitting here in the complete darkness. Uh, but apparently this computer and the air conditioner I have on behind me and someone, they're on the same breaker. And I don't know uh, what happened. But anyway, trip the breaker. It tripped the breaker. All right. Now. Let's get back on to the topic du jour. What we were going to deal with. Let me take a drink, a swig of iced tea. Hang on. All right, here we go. Coming to you live from a top secret broadcasting bunker. Uh, Pastor Mike online, and I am live, and we're going to be dealing with, we lost about 10 minutes there. We're going to be dealing with an issue that, um, as, I was, as I was saying just before, uh, the lights went out here. It's an issue that um, I am not the master. I am not the pope. I am not the doctrinal uh, uh, guru of everybody. What I, what I want people to do, what I encourage you to do, is to do your own study. And I, mean, and I don't mean study what somebody else said. I have a book in my office. It's this thick. I kid you not, it's this thick. It is on what is called the Arminian position, okay, and it's this thick. And somebody sent that to me, and I'll tell you, if you think I'm going to read that, you're crazy, okay? Um, I already have a book that's this thick that I'll read, and I trust, I trust this book. I have built my life and based my life upon that book, my ministry, my marriage, my children, my grandchildren, everything that I do is going to be is based upon what that book says. Not this book and not this guy's book and not what so, Dr. So-and-so from such and such theological seminary said. I am basing my life and my beliefs and my doctrine and my salvation upon what God's word only says and here's 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 what we've got into okay here's what we've got ourselves into we've decided we've relegated what we believe to what we call the experts the theological seminaries and the doctors of divinity and those and those and those we we've, we've we've said whatever whatever you tell us to believe that's what we're going to believe but i'm going to tell you to read it for yourself it's like the, it, and like the issue, we were talking about slain in the spirit a while ago. It's like the issue of slain in the spirit. Anybody with any discernment whatsoever, anybody who's just read the Bible, when they go into one of these churches and a guy says, I want to lay my hands on you quickly and suddenly, and I'm going to slay you in the spirit, you're going, get your hand off me, Jack. You ain't touching me. Because we know what the Bible says. We know that you're not supposed to do that to people, and you're not going to slay my spirit. You might be a murderer. You ain't killing me. And, and I'm being dead serious. If you read the scriptures and know what the Bible says, then if the guy up behind the podium says, oh, you got to be slain in the spirit, you just go, you know what? You're a liar. I'm out of here. I'm not going to this church again. Somebody... Um, uh, in Australia, I think, one of our followers, and we love them dearly. Um, their daughter, I think, is who she said. Their daughter is going to, and this is one of the things I was going to talk about today, but the, the subject we're going to deal with trumped that. And um, I'm looking at uh, the email that they sent, and it's just unbelievable. Their church is going to do what's, they're going to have what's called sex timber. Sex timber, Okay. Uh, and you get it. Okay, it's one of these uh, Grace Point Church, whatever it is. And they're going to deal, and they put flyers on all the pews about what they're going to be talking about in the month of September. And her daughter took issue with it. And she, and she took issue with it on Facebook. And the other people of the church lobbed these grenades of hate. And how dare you go against this? And how dare you do this? 
these people are believing what's coming out of the pulpit and they're following this and and she asked me she said pastor mike my daughter doesn't want to go to this and i said there is no way in the world that i would go to something like this you would not catch me dead in there other than with a camera going i want to get this on film so i can show everybody what you're doing what you're talking about but we have we have relegated our doctrinal positions to what the doctors have said, to what the theologians have said, to what the denominations have said, rather than us doing what Jesus said, and that is study the scriptures. Study the scriptures. The Bereans study the scriptures. The Bereans did not go to the uh, the apostles and said, now you're the apostles, whatever you say, we believe. Well, just whatever you tell us, that's what we'll do. Those are, and I hate using this word, but they're sheeple. They're just doing what they're told to do, and just you, you just do this, and we'll be the religious experts, and we'll tell you how to believe. And so the idea of slain in the Spirit, it's not in the Bible. The phrase is not even the Bible. So if you ask me if I believe you could be slain in the Spirit, I'm going to tell you absolutely you're dead wrong. Show it to me in the Scriptures. Show me in the Bible where it says that. And so anyway, someone asked me the question. Uh, Pastor Mott, and I have had this question come up in an email in almost every Pastor Mike online live broadcast okay I have and I have always skipped over it I've always gone over it okay uh, I've not answered the question somebody asked it to me over the weekend and I and I prayed about it and I said I'll deal with it now, um, I'm probably I'm gonna I'm probably gonna do a couple things. Number one, I'm probably gonna make you mad, okay? Or, or I may not. I don't know. I don't know who's listening right now. Um, and I don't care what doctrinal position you take, okay? I'm probably not gonna say what you want me to say, but I don't work for you anyway, okay? And I'm not, I'm not saying I don't like you. I'm just saying I work for a boss. I work for a master. And he tells me, Mike, you say this and you do this. And that's what I do. Um, and let, and let, me just, let me just say it this way. Uh, there are two alternate viewpoints. There is what's called the Arminian position. And there is the Calvin position. Okay? And, you say, and, and again, somebody sent me a book this big on the Arminian position showing why the Calvin position is stupid. Okay? And then somebody can, from the Calvin position can send me a book this big and say why the, the Arminian. And I have them both. I have both books. Um, as you know that we used to be in the free will Baptist denomination, um, which primarily espouses what's called the Arminian position. Um, those who are of the independent Baptist group, the movement, they do not hold to an Armenian position. They hold to a somewhat of a Calvinist position, and um, they don't get along very well, uh, Southern Baptists and so on. Um, and so what is, the, the question was, Pastor Mike, can you lose your salvation? Now, if you, if you follow my Twitter account or you follow uh, me on Facebook, you saw that up there. The two questions were, uh, can you lose your salvation and is eternal security in the Bible? Okay. And I could, I could actually make this very simple and just move on. And so the simplicity of it is the, I'm going to answer both questions um, with the answer no. Okay. I'm going to answer both questions at the same time. The question was, can you lose your salvation and is eternal security in the Bible? And I'm going to answer the questions and say no Okay, to both questions. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Number one, let's, let's, let's get Jacob, Ar I think his name was Jacob Arminius and John Calvin. Okay, Neither one of these men were apostles, not one of them. Arminius wasn't, Calvin, they were not apostles. These were not the men that Jesus picked. These were not the apostle Paul. They are not even on par with these guys. And I am not obligated. 
I am not obligated scripturally. I'm not obligated in any way to follow what these men say, especially when both of them, you listen to me now, both of them claim to be Christian. Both of them claim to be saved. Both of them claim to be telling you what the Bible says. I can't judge either one. They're dead. I can't judge either one of them. What I can tell you is, is that I am not required to believe what either one of them wrote down. I'm not required to do that. When God, when I stand before God in heaven, he's not going to ask me, why didn't you believe Calvin? If he asked me that, it will absolutely blow my mind that God would ask me that. God is not going to ask me if I believed John Calvin or not. I'm not required to. There's nothing, there's nothing in my manual that says that I have to read Calvin and, and, and follow the tulip doctrine. I don't know if you know what that means. I'm not going to get into it. I, I, there's nothing in here that says I have to do that. There's nothing in here likewise that says I have to go study Jacob Arminius or whatever his name is and find out what he said, find out what he believed, and then, and then follow, follow that. There's nothing in the Bible that says I have to do that. Okay? I, I'm not required to do that. And so I'm at a point in my life where I'm just going, well, if this guy said one thing and this guy said another thing, I'm not going to follow either one of them. I don't know if either one of them's right. So I'm going to go to the scriptures, and that's what I do. I go to the scriptures. And I've been studying the scriptures, and I want to know about the scriptures. Now, I, like I say, our church used to be in the Free Will Baptist movement. We are not anymore. We are an independent, Bible-believing church is what we believe. And people have asked us, where is your, we looked on your website. We want to see your doctrinal statement. And, I'll, and maybe, maybe just part of them, maybe some of the people that want to see a doctrinal statement from us are afraid that we're hiding a secret doctrine like we're wolves. And we're not telling anybody what we really believe. Because what we really believe, we can't tell anybody. Because if we told them, they would know. <laughs> they would know we're, we're wolves. <laughs> okay? And we're not like that. And I know it probably takes a while for people. That's why I like the people. I like the people that write me and say, Pastor Mike, we've been watching you for a year. We haven't written to you. We haven't talked to you. We wanted to know who you were. And they have followed the ministry behind the scenes for a year. And they saw what we, they, they listened to what I said. They heard what I said. They spent a year just listening. And they said, we think we, think we like you. And you know what they're... Man, this is hard. They don't want me to let them down. They don't want me to let them down. That's hard. That's hard for me to handle. Because if there's anybody in this world that can let people down, it's Mike Hoggard. And so I don't want to let anybody down today. I don't want anybody mad at me. You might be upset because of what I'm going to say. But I'm just telling you, I'm not required to follow Jacob Arminius. I'm not required to follow John Calvin. I'm required to follow the faith of Jesus Christ through the King James Bible. And if you want to know what our doctrinal statement is, it's, you start reading in Genesis and get to the end of Revelation. And when you've read that, you have read our doctrinal statement. And we have, we have come up with all these phrases that men have come up with to explain salvation and explain our stand on salvation, such as eternal security and such as lose your salvation. And the truth of it is, the phrase eternal security is not in the Bible. You do not hear me. You do not hear me say eternal security. You do not hear me say, oh, that's why I believe in eternal security. You don't hear me say that because that is a man's, that came out of a man's mouth and a man's mind. Those words are not in the scripture. The phrase, you can't lose your salvation. That's not in the Bible. The phrase once saved, always saved. It's not in the Bible. And so don't ask me, well, I mean, people ask me, they want to know. And I'm answering the question. The qu you're ask they're asking me, do you, do you believe in once saved, always saved? The answer is no. That, that phrase is not in the Bible. And I'm not being nitpicky about words. I'm not. Can you lose your salvation? You will not find in the King James Bible anywhere 
where it says you can lose your salvation or lose your salvation or your salvation is lost, it doesn't say that anywhere. I looked, I looked, I looked, I looked, I looked. Okay? And, uh, well, let me, let me get into it. So what do you believe? What do you believe? Okay? Um, what, what, what is salvation? Uh, can it be? Can a person? Uh, is is there such a thing as apostasy? Can a person fall away? If you ask me, can a person fall away? I will say it says in Hebrews six, uh, if they shall fall away. That I just that's what I believe. Um, if you ask me, does God pre, does God preserve His saints? I will say yes because that is what the Scripture says. And you say you're being contradictory, Pastor Mike. No, I don't think I am. I really don't think I am. When we learn to use Bible language in our questions, in our discussions, in our speech, um, there is a guy that is on Facebook all the time, and I want to like the guy. I think he's probably got a good heart, but his methods and his his methods are annoying to me because he makes all kinds of statements on Facebook and he never gives scripture. I mean, he just makes up, he's making up stuff right and left and he never gives scripture. And I, I said, can you give scripture? Well, I just think everybody ought to know the Bible. I would, I don't assume that anymore. I don't assume that anybody knows anything. That's why I'd like to give them a lot of Bible verses. And I just think that if we're gonna have a conversation if we're going to have a talk, let me, uh, since I had to restart my computer, I had to restart everything else. I'm going to pull my email thing back up. Um, and I'm going to try to pull my document up that I had, and I hope I can get it because there it is. Uh, thank you, Lord. Okay. Because <clears throat> I had worked on this previously, and I and I had some verses ready to, <clears throat> to share with you. So anyway, what is the doctrine? that we as Christians, that we as born-again, Bible-believing Christians can hang on to. What is that idea? What is that doctrine? Uh, am, I going to, am I really going to go to heaven when I die? Am I going to be caught up in the translation? And um, there's even an argument about that. Well, the rapture's not, the word rapture's not in the Bible. So the idea, the translation is, and being caught up. And so I, I am learning to use Bible language when I speak. That way, if you say the translation is not in the Bible, I can say you're a liar because it is, and I'm going to be in it. And so anyway, if you want to ask me what I believe, just ask, just say, Pastor Mike, Ephesians 5:28. Do you believe that? <laughs> yeah, I do. I absolutely believe that. Let me give you an example here. Okay, um, and I, didn't, boy, I, I am now that my computer shut off. Half of what I was going to do is gone. And I don't know if that's of the Lord or, or whatever. Paul's in the book of Ephesians uh, uses the word predestinated. And so if you ask me, Pastor Mike, do you believe in the doctrine of predestination? I'll say, well, I believe it says right here in Ephesians 1, 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Yeah, I believe that. But then they'll want to tie me into some, well, but, but do you think that predestination means this? or pre Don't ask me what I think it means. Ask me if I believe what it says, and I will tell you, yes, I believe what it says. Am I making sense to anybody here? Because that's what I want to do. I want to make sense. I, want, I think the Bible, once we start reading it, will, will, uh, will make sense. People say, are you a dispensationalist? Well, I'm looking here in Ephesians 1.10. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. So if you ask me if there's a dispensation, I'll say yes. It says it right here that there's a dispensation. But if you're asking me if I believe in some guys, how he worded out, dis, oh, there's dispensation to this and everything falls into this dispensation. If you're asking me if I believe that, I'll tell you no, because I don't even know what it is. I don't even know every all the letters of Tulip. I don't ever know everything that Arminius said. I don't know that everybody, I think Clarence Larkin came up, uh, wrote a book on dispensational truth. I've never read the book. I think I have it in my library. I've never read it. Not required to. Not required to. It's like the people who, when I started the first Peter Bible study years ago, they said, oh, Pastor Mike, please stop. Stop it. 
you need to go to such and such doctor's website so you can be educated on the on first peter and that we're not supposed to believe it's for us and i'm not doing it i'm not going to anybody's website looking for whether or not I should believe what's in this book. I will believe what's in this book, and I will believe every word that this book tells me to believe. So let's let's get into it, okay? Let's get into it. Uh, and you know what? I could probably spend an hour today just dealing with predestination, okay? The way that the Bible says it. I could get into that. I could do it exactly the way the Bible says by just using the word predestined or predestination. Dispensation, the same thing. I could tell you everything that the Bible says about it. You see, I believe that the Bible's written plainly. I believe that you, I believe that you, you could be 14 years old and you could read this Bible and understand plainly what it says. I believe you could be 90 years old and read this Bible and understand what it says. That's what I believe. And so anyway, let me read a verse here. John chapter 10, verse 28. Here's what Jesus said. I give unto them eternal life. Now, so if you ask me, Pastor Mike, you believe in eternal life? Yeah, it just it says right there. I, believe, I, gave, I give unto them eternal life. I believe that. And they shall never perish. I believe that. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I believe that. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I believe that. I believe every word, and you don't have to ask me four or five questions about how I believe it or in what context I believe it. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant if you take a verse and you want, to, you want to jam my belief of that verse into some man's doctrinal statement, don't bother. I'm not falling for that. I'm not going to go along with it. I'm only, I believe what this verse says in the context of the entire scripture, I believe exactly what this verse says. And I'm not setting you up for anything. I'm just telling you that's what I believe. And by the way, I like it. I like this verse. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand because if my father says that I'm saved, there is not a single human being on the earth that can pronounce me unsaved. Not one. I, see, I like that verse, and I like exactly what it says. No man is able to pluck me out of my father's hand. It is not in their power. If God says that I, if God has given me eternal life and I shall never perish, no man can ever pronounce me a lost sinner. No man can. I love it. Okay? I love it. Let me read another verse to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to listen to the language here. Who shall also confirm you, confirm you unto the end. You should ask me, Pastor Mike, do you believe that we'll be confirmed unto the end? That's what it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Who shall, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I believe that. And what I did was I just, I was praying and I said, God, give me a word and, and the, the phrase, the end. And I'm looking at verses that have the end in it. And I love it. Hebrews chapter three, verse five. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now, I just read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, who shall also confirm you unto the end. There is the confirmation of God, and then in Hebrews chapter 3, 3 there is the holding fast unto the end by us. Now, here is, here is, what, um, here is here's, here's what people want to do. They say it's either perseverance or it's preservation. You've got to pick one. And I'm going, well, I'm reading in the Bible, and I see them both, so why do I have to pick just one? Because both of them are there. Both themes of preservation and perseverance are in the Scripture. Why is it that somebody wants me to pick just one of them when they're both there? And here I am. I'm reading, who shall con also confirm you unto the end. That's the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. It's the sealing. I have verses on sealing up here. And then Hebrews 3 again. 
um, if we, uh, a Christ is the son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So is it, is it um, God's preservation or is it man's perseverance? Yes, both. They work together. They Two are working together here. Two of them are. Let me, let me explain it like this, okay? Um, a guy that never wants to be saved and wants to go to hell and wants to live a sinful life, is God going to save him? No, he's not because he doesn't want to be saved. He doesn't want to He doesn't want to stay in church. He doesn't want to keep going to Sunday school. He doesn't want to do anything. Is God going to save that guy? No, he's not. Okay? Uh, likewise, it's, it's like us thinking that all of our works are keeping us saved with God, and that's not true either. They both work hand in hand. Uh, verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 3, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren. Ta listen to who he's talking to. Take heed, brethren. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Listen to what he's saying here. Okay? And he's telling you to, he's in this context, in Hebrews 3, he's saying, you hold fast because you could harden your heart. Whereas those who are strictly this say, you will never harden your heart. Okay? They work together. And if they don't work together, the whole thing's off. I hope I'm not confusing you. You're going, what? Just hang on, okay? I'm going to show you how this works. Um, let's see here. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Boy, there, and I want you to get this right here. There, here it is right here. The deceitfulness of sin. Now we have two things that we can contrast one another. Belief and deceit. Belief and deceit. Do you believe what God said? Do you believe everything that God said? Or have you been deceived into thinking that there are things that God said that are not true, not true and you don't have to pay attention to it? You see where it goes here? Sin deceives. And I'm not talking about the sins of Barack Obama. I'm not talking about the sins of Nancy Pelosi. I'm not talking about the sins of Prince William. I'm not talking about the sins of, of, uh, of Marilyn Manson. I'm talking about yours. Your sin will deceive you. You, you went down to an altar. You prayed. You asked the Lord to come into your heart and all of this stuff. And then a year later, you have actually no intention of living for the Lord. You're full of sin. Sin is choking out the word. We're going to go to Mark chapter 4 and see how it works. Um, and you say, you're, see, you're already sounding like you believe you can lose your salvation. No. I didn't say you got saved. I didn't say that. Okay? Um... For we are made partakers of Christ, and this is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, our confidence, not our salvation. The beginning of our confidence, steadfast in the end. You know what the word confidence has in it? It has the word fide. You know what fide is? Faith. Faith. Faith is belief. You believe God, you trust God, and you hold that. You don't stop. Nobody is going to go to heaven who quit believing in God and quit believing God could do things for them. Nobody's there that stood before God and said, God, you know, man, you dropped the ball on me. I just, I just, uh, I just don't have a lot of confidence in you. There's no one standing before the throne like that. Now, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. 
For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, be not, uh, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And by the way, it's still, salvation still is an inheritance. It's not given to those, and I'm going to use a Bible term here. So if, if, you, if you're sensitive to this kind of language, number one, blame God. It's in the Bible. Okay? Uh, bastard. <gasps> See, I, I don't like saying, but that's in the Bible. And the scriptures say, in fact, I'm going to, it's, man, it's going to take me a while. Okay? I'm going to have to do a couple funny things with my computer to get quick verse to work here. But I'm going to look that word up here in a little bit, okay? Study the word bastard in the Bible. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. I had a misunderstanding of what the Bible said concerning that word bastard. By the way, a bastard is what you think it is in the Bible. It's someone without an inheritance. It's someone that is not going to heaven. They are. That's what an inheritance is, okay? Um let me see if I can pull this up here very, very quickly. It's going to take me a couple seconds. But I actually had, while I talk, I'm going to, I'm going to work here. I actually had a misunderstanding of the, of the word bastard. I actually told a preacher one time, the Bible said that you can become bastards. Let me type this in here, okay? Uh, let, me do it. let me do it this way. Hebrews 12, 8. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. And I actually told a preacher one time years ago, I said, the Bible says you can become bastards. And you know what I did? I misquoted the scripture. When I went back and read the scripture, I was corrected. You cannot, it does not say you can become bastards. It says you are a bastard. You are not getting an inheritance. You're, you have no father. Okay? He's, you're not named after him. He's not your daddy. You're not getting part of the will. You're not getting an inheritance. That's what it is. And, it, and, and the Bible corrected me. Because I said it says you become bastards. And, and no, it doesn't. It says you are. That's what you are. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. And it has everything to do with sonship. Are you a son of God? You say yes. Then do you receive the correction of God? And if you don't, you're not a son. The Bible is clear on that. And it's also clear to me that if you are a son, you are a son. Period. Okay? And I know that I'm probably, there's probably people listening going that are of a, what they are called a ter, eternal security background that are liking the things that I'm saying about what favors their position and some people that are of not the eternal security background that are, not, that are liking the things that I'm saying about that. And I'm trying to get you to understand, so I'm trying to get you to understand that the Bible has more to say than what your church's doctrinal statement said. I was from a free will Baptist background. I started studying it on my own, on independently. But that didn't make me want to be an independent Baptist or a Southern Baptist or anybody else's kind of Baptist. It didn't make me want to be that. It made me want to be just what the Bible says. Oh, boy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You see, final salvation is coming. And it's called the end of your faith. It's your faith and your trust. It's not based upon what you do or what you didn't do, but it's based upon whether you believe or not. I'm going to ask you a question. How many people do you know right now? Okay. How many people do you know right now that 20 years ago used to be, I mean, you used to see them on fire for the Lord and you knew that their, their doctrine was right. And now 20 years later, you, you can't even tell 
what they believe. I mean, and they're believing and they're falling for all these aberrant doctrines and all these doctrines of devils and, and they're doing the contemplative. How many of you know people like that? You know what's happening with them? They're being led into disbelieving or trying to bypass the cross. They're being led. They are falling away, people. And the question is, the question is, were they saved? Were they saved? Okay. And I've said this before. There is a difference between a man like a preacher or a church or denomination telling you you're saved and God telling you you're saved. There is a difference. Okay. No man, if no man can pronounce that you're lost and pluck you out of God's hand, no man can pronounce truthfully that you're saved. No man can do that. Uh, First Peter chapter one, verse 13, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is, see the definite language here, that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you as holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And what I, and what I see in this is, is that those who are truly saved, number one, they're obedient. Number two, they don't fashion themselves in the former lust. And number three, they are holy in their conversation and they believe God. They are the ones who kept believing God. Revelation 2.25. But that which, ye have al that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. He that overcometh, and here it is, keepeth my works unto the end. What is the works of Christ? It's this Bible. Keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power of the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. And so on. Um, so, but he talks about overcoming and keeping. That's your responsibility. My works unto the end. And so God made a promise. That promise is an absolute, it is an unbreakable promise. But that promise only applies to those who start believing, stay believing, and finish believing. And God already knows who they are. Does that make sense to everybody? God already knows who the ones are that started believing, kept believing, and finished believing. God already knows who they are. Okay? I hope that makes sense. God already knows. Now, here's, here's one that I really like. Okay? Okay? Um, because a, a majority now, let's say that, let's say the Southern Baptist convention. Okay. And I, for years I grew up, I thought, man, I thought the Southern Baptists were the good guys. Okay. Um, let's, the Southern Baptist convention, their, their doctrinal statement talks about eternal security. Okay. That God, God preserves everybody and God keeps people. And once you come down to the altar and you pray the prayer and this and that and the other, then you're saved and you can never lose your salvation is what they'll tell you. Okay. Now, um, we no longer use the King James Bible anymore because we know it's full of mistakes and we use all these other translations. And actually all of those translations are faulty because um, the God inspired the Bible only in the original manuscripts and the original manuscripts contains all the words of God, but we don't have all the words of God now because he didn't keep them. That's contradictory. Psalm 12, verse six, the words of the Lord are pure. You know what the word are is? Is that past, present or future? It's right now. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And I'm going to say something, okay? And I don't want to be mean about it. And you need to remember that at one time I quit believing that the Bible was the inspired word of God. I quit believing that. I, I, it makes me sick to my stomach to think that I was in such a spiritual condition at one time behind the pulpit that I didn't believe the Bible was the word of God anymore. It makes me sick to my stomach to think that I could have died. I, that I didn't want to think about it. But to me, it does not make sense that you can say 
that God keeps people from being lost once they get saved, but he cannot keep his word. That bothers me. You see, I happen to believe that God not only is able, but he swore that he would keep both. He would keep both of them. That's what he swore to. Okay? It's what he swore to. He promised that he would keep the word. He promised. And, and by the way, our salvation is hinged upon his word. And if God didn't keep his word, how does he expect us to keep his word? It's impossible. If he says, keep my commandments or keep my words, if he says to us, keep his words, and then we admit, we admit to people that we don't have all the words of God, what is that telling people? And so I believe that he kept both. He kept me. Listen to me. He kept me. God kept me at a time when I should not have been kept. God kept me. Just telling you where I came from. Psalm 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. See, I believe that. I believe that you can ask God. Wow. I've asked him. I've asked God to preserve me. I always tell you, you'll hear me preach every now and then. When you're feeling really good and spiritual, that's the time to prepare for the days that you're not feeling very good and spiritual. When you're feeling really good and very spiritual, those are the times when you should say, God, I know what no good thing is in my flesh. And I'm asking you right now, while I'm good, I'm asking you to hold on to me in times when I know that I'm not going to be. God will honor that kind of honesty, people. And so I think you ought to, I think you ought to say what David said. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. And I'm just, I'm going to say this very simply. I think that if you ask God to preserve you, I think he will. I think he'll preserve you. Psalm 25, 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me. Okay, now, now we're looking, now I like this. Now we're looking at how, how God preserves integrity and uprightness, two things, okay? Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Personal integrity and personal uprightness. And by the way, where do they come from? Um, can I tell you that I have drugged my name through the mud, and so have you? If I were to ask you, if I were to go back through the history of your life, and I'm not talking about how you are right now, or maybe I am. If I were to go back through the history of your life, and ask you the question, have you been upright and has your integrity remained high all the days of your life, you would have to admit and say no. Because what you and I have done is that we have drug our name through the mud. God is the one who gives us integrity. God is the one who gives us uprightness. And that's what preserves us. Psalm 31, 23, O love the Lord, all ye his saints. Listen to this. For the Lord preserveth the faithful. Now, if you were to ask me, do you believe in eternal security? I might just respond and say, I believe the Lord preserveth the faithful. And you might be mad at me because I didn't say, yes, I believe in eternal security. You might be angry with me. You might be upset with me. You say, well, I'll never go to your church or I'll never listen to what a thing you say because you don't believe what Dr. So-and-so said. You didn't believe eternal security. Don't even ask me anymore. Okay. Don't ask me, if you're trying to ask me so that you think you can fellowship with me, I'm telling you that I believe what this Bible says, and I believe that verse. I believe that the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. The proud doer, he's against. 
He's going to give them bad rewards, but he preserveth the faithful. Here we are back to belief. Do you believe? Do you believe what God said? Do you be, and you say, well, yeah, I believe the original manuscripts. I, it's not the same. Because now you're saying that you believe in something that absolutely does not exist, and you think, God's, you think God up there is fooled. He's not. Psalm 32, 7, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. I believe that. Psalm 37, 28, For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. He doesn't forsake his saints. And God knows who they are. That's like the idea of predestination. How is it that God elects people? Because he, and how did he predestinate them? Because he already knows from before the beginning who's going to believe him and who's not going to believe him. He already knows it. He already does. God knew my dad. God knew my dad was going to believe him. And I lived through 20 some odd years of my life thinking my dad was going to go to hell. And God knew all along. And he preserved my dad. He kept him. But also my dad had to come to a place in his life where he had no other choice than to call on God. No other choice. Psalm 37, 28, For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. See, I just, I believe that. He doesn't forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. I believe it. By the way, let me, it says the seed of the wicked. Let me throw this in here. For we are saved by incorruptible seed, by the word of God, not, not by corruptible seed. There is a difference. There is a difference. And I am, I'm not even, even with the delay and, and everything, I'm not going to get through all this. So I probably just wasted an hour and a half of your day today, and I apologize for that. Um... Psalm 40, uh, verse 11, Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. Here it is right here. You listen to me. You listen to me real good. We are not preserved by something that itself is not preserved. We are not preserved by corruptible things. We're not, pre hey, the Southern Baptist Convention was not around in the days of Paul. And there may come a time when it won't be around at all. The movements of, of Christianity have come, have waxed and waned, and they fade away. The denominations, the st hey, I'm going to ask you a question. Those of you who were part of a denominational church and have come out, are you still saved? Because you realize that the denominations are corrupting right now. And if you choose to follow the denomination, this verse says that you, you are kept and you are preserved by incorruption, by things that are preserved themselves. Did God preserve his word? If you say yes, then he will preserve you through that preserved word. Are you, is your, is your salvation incorruptible? Yes, but only if it's based upon an incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That's where I'm getting with this. Okay. That's where I'm going with this. You, so if you want to believe once saved, always saved, then I want to tell you something. You had better believe that God spoke this Bible and every word in it is right is what you better believe. So don't tell me, don't tell me you believe in eternal security and yet you believe God dropped the ball on the Bible. I don't believe you. You're a liar. And I love you. Okay? Psalm 61, verse 7, He shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. Mercy and truth. Truth. There it is, truth again. What did Jesus say? Thy word is truth. 
It's the word that preserves us. It's the word that saves us. And it's our belief. And by the way, you cannot give a the incorruptible word to a guy that says, I'm not ever reading this. I'm not ever going to believe it. I'm not going to. You can give me this Bible if you want to, but I don't want anything to do with it. He's not saved because he's holding a Bible in his hand. What does he have to do? He has to believe it. Why didn't the Israelites get the inheritance? They didn't believe. God sent 12 spies into the land. They 10 of them come back. 10 of them said, we can't go in there. They're too big for us. Two guys, one name Old Testament, one name New Testament, came back and said, well, sure we can believe, well, sure we can believe God. God said we could go in there. Why don't we believe God? And the Israelites died in the wilderness without the inheritance because they didn't believe what God said. Don't tell me your little preservation, eternal security thing. They quit believing. And yet two did. Who are the only two, the only two that came out of Egypt that got to go into the promised land? It was the only two guys that believed. They believed what God said because God's word in them was incorruptible. They walked around in the wilderness. They went in there. They saw the danger. They come out and they said, you know what? We see the guys. They're giants. But God said we could have it. And they believed. And Paul mentioned that specifically that lest you have an a, a unbelieving heart in departing from the living God. That's what the Bible says. Do I believe in biblical preservation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Based upon an incorruptible word. That's what I believe. Psalm 86, 2, preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou, my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. See, save the servant that trusteth in thee. That's belief. That's faith. Be merciful unto me, O Lord. I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. You know what I've done? I've given this to God and said, God, here, you take it. I don't, I, I don't, put, it, don't put it in my hands anymore. Psalm 97, 10, ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. I believe that. Psalm 116, 6, the Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. And I'll tell you, and, and I preached a Sunday morning on pride. There are no proud people in heaven. There will not be a proud person in heaven. They don't exist. I was brought low and he helped me. Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He, will, he that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. For the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is the, thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from his time forth even forevermore. Well, now, what we, we, don't have the, we don't have the real Bible. The real Bible existed in the days of the original manuscripts, but God has not preserved his word today. It don't work that way. Psalm 140. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart continually. Are they gathered together for war? They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Keep me, keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purposed to overthrow my goings. Here again, God preserves. You ask to God to preserve. He preserves. Proverbs 2 8, he keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth. Oh, look at this. In fact, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 2 8. There it is, right there, what I've been saying. He keepeth the paths of judgment, that's the Bible, and preserveth the way of his saints. There it is. Uh, I want to read some emails. I want to see how, oh my goodness. Got a bunch of them here. Um, let's see here. That's, this is the can't see the program one, okay? How about, um, let's start here. Okay, we're offline, offline, okay. How about, uh, okay, here we go. This is uh, JD. 
says, God bless you, Pastor Mike, for telling it like this. However, listening to your past Sunday sermon and Brady's sermon Sunday night, I am once again doubting my salvation, but that's okay. I don't want you to do that, okay? Because better to be lost and believe the truth than be lost and believe a lie that you're saved when you're not. Pray for me. Everybody pray for JD, okay? Um, well, let's see here. I want to get to what's what are we dealing with today. I asked. I'm asking you to. I'm going to start at the top here. I'm asking you to keep your comments based upon what we're saying today. Uh, Luann says, KJV, one truth. Those who err from the truth are sinners. Keep preaching, Pastor Mike. Praying for you. I pray. All right, appreciate that. Um, Mark says, your webcast resumed. It was one of the best one and a half hours I've watched. It was not a waste of time. You made clear a longstanding question I've had. Thank you. Shirley Kaufman, time not wasted. I've learned so much today. Thank you for your honesty and faithfulness to tell us the truth. Trish, uh, let's see, has a prayer request. I'm, I'm going to hold that for later. Bill says, so far, my brother, you've never wasted my time. Why? Because it's not my time. It's God's time, and I'm quite sure you will not intentionally waste God's time. I appreciate that. Um, Nancy says, quick question. Do you believe in the power of prayer for someone who does not want to believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, intercede for them. Now, you, you can't save somebody just by praying, okay? But you can pray for somebody to be saved, and God just might answer that prayer, okay? Answer that prayer. Um, amen. Luann says, Wherefore, my brethren, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And, I, and, and Luann, I'm glad you brought that up, because if there's any way that I want you to think about today's broadcast, it's this. Be careful about letting a denomination tell you that you're saved or that you're lost. Be careful. Okay. I, and, and again, well, at one time, the denomination served a tremendous purpose. Number one, that was kept us from killing one another. Because we don't all see the Bible the same way, and I understand that. But right now, they are the, the, the denominations are nothing but the sick pot of, of vomit that is destroying Bible Christianity. Okay? Your salvation is your responsibility. And, and I want to say, say, say this very, very strongly to you. If you're relying upon what some preacher told you when you were nine years old, that you got saved and that you can never, ever lose your salvation or this and that and the other, and you've been relying on that, and you've been living like the devil for the past 40 years, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. Am I saying you need to get saved? What I'm telling you is if you think that just because some guy told you you're eternally saved and yet you've been living like the devil himself for the past 40 years, you're in, you're in danger. Let me say this. If it was up to me at one point in my life, I would not be here. I promise you I wouldn't. God kept me. He kept me. And he brought me to a place where now I believe what this book says. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. Believe what it said. Melinda has an opinion or two. Dear Pastor Mike, this has been a great use of two hours of our time. I pray, Jesus, that your father accepted Jesus Christ. He did. Uh, it is so true that only the Holy Spirit can assure us that we are saved. Uh, Romans 8, 16. For the first 10 years of my quote-unquote salvation, everyone believed I was saved, and I believe I was saved. However, my first supposed 10 years was characterized by, by continual disobedience, and I backslid in such a way that is wicked above all imagination. The last 10 years, I've been obedient, and I didn't really think about my salvation until recently, and then I had a real struggle believing whether I, I was saved or not. I stood on the word of Romans 8, 16, and asked the Lord to make that real to me if I was saved, and he has, and I am so grateful. He is good. Everything you said today was true all of it thank you i i, I listen i i i don't want to i don't want to put more questions in your mind okay but i want you to get your salvation ideas from the king james bible is what i want um andrea says there is predestination which assumes god god doesn't follow linear time do you believe in retroactive prayer no that's that's silly we are bound by time 
and human events are bound by time. God is not. God has knowledge, foreknowledge of all events at all times. But retroactive prayer, I don't, I don't buy, I've never heard of that before. And it's not, I don't see scripture. I do not see scripture. Uh, Denny says, you didn't waste anybody's time today. This is something that I was desperate and I mean to, and, and I mean desperate to hear. Thank you, brother. Praise God. I got to hear this message. Uh, Ralph said, I would not say you wasted an hour and a half of my time today. There's something about being thoroughly confusing that makes one think harder. Just saying, I love you, Ralph. Uh, Michelle, thank you enough for loving us enough to tell the truth. If we truly love people, we tell the truth, even though they, we know they will not like, like it or us. If we truly love you for standing for the truth. And I'm not done with this. I'm not done with this. Um, you can plan on Thursday. I'm going to continue. And I've got all kinds of new stuff to talk about. Uh, but you can plan on Thursday that I'm going to continue this because I wasn't, I'm not done. I've got a lot more verses to, um, uh, to deal with on this issue. Okay. Um, David Ferguson said 30 seconds of the word from the KJV Bible are worth far more than one and a half hours. David, you said it right. Okay, Jennifer, why do so many rely heavily on John 3.16 and then say it is all we need to be saved? So many churches say that is all you need and then you do not, then do not give you anything further on the subject. Jennifer, that is a good point and I appreciate that. Uh, Jeff says, uh, what to make of one who believes the Bible, believes in Christ, but has a pattern of sin that no prayer or study has relieved. Struggle with this since I was six and molested. Lust has been a burden ever since and nothing has diminished it. Jeff, you're the one I'm going to be dealing with on Thursday. And I want you to listen to what Jeff said, okay? He believes the Bible, he believes Christ, but has a pattern of sin that no prayer or study has relieved. I'm going to deal with, in fact, you just nailed it for me right there. Because I'm going to deal with your issue in this, in this subject of salvation. I'm going to deal with it on Thursday. God told you to write that, okay? Um, Jonathan says, just to clarify, please correct me if I'm wrong. We're always saved as long as we continue to seek after God and his will. But we are capable of stepping. But we, and I'm having trouble reading your email because it's, it's crafted kind of not like a question. The, you have a question mark at the end of a sentence that says we are always saved as long as we continue to seek after God and his will. Question mark. What I'm going to say to you, Jonathan, is this. God knows the ones who, who keep believing and continue to believe this book. God knows the ones who at the end believe what God said and trust in him for salvation. God knows that. Those are the clearly, clearly in the scripture, those are the ones he elected those are the ones he predestinated. Those are the ones he sealed. And I haven't even got into the seal of God yet. Clearly in the Bible, those are the ones who produce fruit. Or, let's, excuse me, let me, let me bring this, let me say Bible words. Those are the ones who bring forth fruit. Okay? The ones he elected, the ones he predestinated, the ones he sealed are the ones who bring forth fruit. God knows who they are. God knows that. But I'm going to tell you something, and we're going to get into this. We're going to get into this on Thursday. I'm going to encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 6, not just the little tiny verse that everybody wants to use out of Hebrews 6, but I'm going to tell you to read all of Hebrews 6, and then I'm going to tell you to read Mark chapter 4. Because there are clearly, clearly four different types of people in Mark chapter 4 that have the seed sown on them. This incorruptible seed sown on them. Four groups of people that have seed sown in them. And Jesus talks about each group and only one group of those who have the, the incorruptible seed of the word of God sown in them. Only one of them produces the fruit, only one. And so, Jonathan, ask yourself the question, who am I in this parable? Who am I in this parable? That's the question you need to ask. 
A um, couple more emails. Uh, Joshua, hello, Pastor Mike. Thank you very much for all your biblical teaching. According to God's word, I wanted to ask you about the scripture verses. I think in Romans it says, if you go on sinning, there remains no more sacrifice for your sins. Going to get to that Thursday. And uh, Flavio says, thank you in your devotion, your dedication, and glad God gave you a wife that allows you the time needed to study and be in God's word. Uh, thank her for me too. Sweetie pie, they love you. Okay. Uh, I love you too, and uh, I want you to do your homework, and I want you to know where I'm going. I'm not going to try to hide it, hi, try to hide anything from you. Uh, I want you to know where I'm going. All right, and um, but we're going to deal with the issue uh, that the guy brought up about. Okay, am I saved because I still sin? Okay, uh, I'm going to deal with that Thursday. Okay, and I appreciate appreciate your uh, patience and your love. And um, again, we're gonna. This is what we're gonna be dealing with this with the this week in the Pastor Mike live broadcast. So keep your comments, questions, and things related uh, to that. All right, I, I I love you. I thank you for loving me. I don't want to be your enemy. Um, I would like to be your friend in the Lord. Okay, but I'm. Let's just let's just. If you're gonna ask me. Oh, how come you don't just ask me what verse? And I'll tell you what I believe. All right. God bless you. Bye. Would you be mine? Could you be mine?